everyone could just take a seat. Uh, I think we're ready to start um, start the meetup. So, um, first of all, evening everyone, uh, and a warm welcome to our AI and data science meetup. Um, I'm Daniel Neves, in case none of you know me, but uh, I'm the co-founder of the AI in data science meetup here in Berlin. Uh, and this is our fourth stop on our data world tour. Um, our previous stops included the likes of Zurich, Munich, uh, last week Copenhagen, and our next stops include uh, New York, Boston, and our final stop being in Amsterdam. I um, appreciate some of those destinations aren't exactly local. So um, uh, for you guys, if you want to experience that, that meetup experience in, the, in other locations, um, you'll be able to gain the content on our website and actually watch the, the live stream back on and, and look at all the content itself. Um, I'll run through our schedule for tonight. So first speaker, we have Connor Dargan standing at the back over there, um, senior data scientist at Outfittery. And then we have a double act from Scout24 and Sebastian Boltz, data science manager. And Mike Goetzer, data scientist, and then we have Tobias Holzer, who's in the crowd somewhere, a uh, machine learning engineer. Um, so before we kick off the presentations, I uh, just want to make you aware, I'm just in the way here, but of our uh, competition. So as you can see, you can win two tickets to Data Natives, um, which is on the 22nd, 23rd of November. Um, and it's, it's actually a really interesting prize because um, you, you get accommodation uh, and you also get the, the tickets themselves. Um, and the accommodation is provided by Darwin, and Data Natives have provided the, the tickets, obviously. I think combined, the prize is worth about £1,800, which is not a bad uh, prize, considering it's free to enter. Um, and for those, it is for those only that are here in attendance today. Um, for those watching on live stream, um, unfortunately not for you guys, but obviously feel free to come along to the event, as there's some great content there, there to be shown. Um, if you have a look inside the blue booklets, I think on the chairs, you'll be able to find some more information about the competition as well. Um, so just to give you guys a bit of an insight into us uh, as a business, so we're around a business of 150, I don't know if you guys knew that, but um, we are kind of structured both geographically and technologically, technologically as well. So um, you have myself focusing across Germany within, uh, within data science and also my co-colleague and co-founder of the meetup, Mark, um, he also focuses across data, across Germany as well within data. Um, and then you have my, uh, my colleague Sam Cowie standing at the back over there. Um, he focuses on data as well, but more specifically within robotics and automotive. And then we have Rebecca standing at the back over there as well. Uh, she focuses more on the candidate side. She'll be, so she'll be able to give you guys real insight into, into what she's seen from, from discussing these topics with, with data guys themselves and, uh, and the trends that she's seen as well. Um, but uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of an insight into what I've seen personally um, from working within data for around the best part of two years now. So when I first started, there was a huge demand um, across Berlin, across Germany for data scientists. Um, but now over the last six months or so, we've seen a, a, quite a shift towards more of the infrastructure and engineering side, um, also more of the DevOps side where, and we believe as a business and from our discussions with a lot of, a lot of companies, um, as and when a company or business has upscaled their, their data science activities, um, they've then realized, well, actually, we need to upscale our, our infrastructure as well, hence the demand for a lot of cloud guys, engineers, and, and DevOps specialists. So um, yeah, feel free to grab me afterwards as well, to perhaps we can go into that in a bit more detail and into the trends that we've seen personally as a business and, and overall within data. Um, obviously, yeah, we have some more insight there as well, so feel free to grab any one of myself, Samuel, uh, as well. So um, I think, yeah, we'll kick off uh, the speakers. So Connor, if you want to do the honors, you're first up. I sort of have them. You can like hover, you hover over them. Oh, you okay. can. <laughs> Is this, if this connected to the internet, I could just get them on Google Slides. 
Oh god. Firstly, can you even hear me through this? Yeah. Okay, one thing to add. Um, I can just wing it. <laughs> I might need to hover over that thing to remind me what I'm supposed to say from time to time. Great. So, by a quick show of hands, um, who actually knows who Outfittery are or what we do? Yeah, it's most of you. Okay, so for those who don't, uh, we're an e-commerce company for men's clothing. The way the system works is you, well, you have to be a man. Um, you order a box of clothes from us. Your personal stylist will pack that box for you, send it out to you. You try them on. You keep what you want. You send back what you don't want, and you only pay for what you keep. So, and a standard problem of any e-commerce company is providing product recommendations to customers. So you have a set of customers, a set of products, and you want to recommend to each customer the best product for them, the one they're most likely to buy. Now, generally how this is done is you, you have all your products, you have all your customers, and for each customer you'll have, or for each product, you'll have a variety of customers that's been sold to, and you can kind of try sell it to similar customers from there. So if Amazon had a book, that was sold to a load of 20-something-year-old guys, they're going to try advertise it to a few 20-something-year-old guys. And this is kind of a standard enough thing throughout most e-commerce companies. However, at Outfittery, there are a couple of quirks that change how we need to make this recommendation problem. So the first one is that any recommendations that we actually show to customers are a combination of human and artificial intelligence. So any recommendations the data science team makes or any um, our models make get shown to the stylist and then the stylist can choose to use or ignore those um, as appropriate in order to pack the box. So this brings about obvious differences in the nature of any implementation or the exact kind of optimization goal itself. But what makes me so excited about this or what I find most interesting in this is that there's got to be potential somewhere along this loop for humans to learn something from artificial intelligence. Rather, so I feel in the world very much at the moment, it's artificial intelligence is learning how to copy humans. It's learning either explicitly how to copy us or our labeled data. And we've never got really get much insight into the world from those. And I would love if there was potential to do that someday. So the biggest problem we face in trying to make recommendations is essentially the cold start problem on steroids. So the cold start problem itself is when you get a new item of stock in that you've never tried to sell before or never shown it to customers before. So you have no good sales data as to like, what kind of customers even like this. However, at Affittery, we face that problem to a much bigger extent. Every half a year, our entire stock changes with the new items for the new season. So not only do we have a huge influx of items which we have no sales data on, but we also lose all the we stop stocking all of the items which we do have good sales data on. It would be as if Netflix replaced their entire video collection every six months. So the third problem we really have is kind of, so in, with the cold star problem, generally what you do with that is you, you use predictor variables rather than the item itself. So let's say this navy shirt. Um, instead of say, looking at sales data for this exact navy shirt, we could look at navy shirts in general. So we might have a cluster of customers, we might look at them, we might know that they, they like navy shirts, so we'd recommend to them this navy shirt. I know this works well for, I guess, most things. Like I'd imagine from predictor variables of a meal, so if you think about reading a menu in a restaurant, you'd be able to predict with a reasonably good accuracy whether you would actually like whatever you're reading or won't. Similarly with a movie, if you read like a few variables of the movie, it might be the genre, it might be a few actors in it, a description of it, you can probably predict with reasonable accuracy whether you're going to like that movie or not. However, try reading, try reading this description of an item of clothing and telling me whether you would like it or not, or even just imagining what it looks like. ruin my point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So I'm going to assume you all didn't know what it looked like, just to prove my central point. Great. So if you're not going to be able to predict very well whether you're going to like something by reading you know, the description, a few attributes about it, how can you expect an algorithm or a computer to be able to figure it out for you? So we clearly have to use image data in some way if we're to make proper recommendations to customers. Now this leads us on to a standard classification network where you feed through your input vector, feed it through the network, trains to predict an output. And this approach has been shown to work quite well. It also has the advantage of being relatively simple to build. There's great libraries for doing this quite quickly. However, it provides zero insight into why it predicted X or why it predicted Y. So we can't use it to glean much information back for our stylus, say. But the biggest disadvantage of these is the huge amount of training data required to build a useful network. So if you think about it, it has to map the relationship between each individual pixel and whatever it is you're trying to predict. So imagine if we could compress all the information stored in an image down into a much smaller vector. Well, that's where autoencoders come in. So an autoencoder is simply a network that's trained to predict its input. That's essentially it. So if you input, if your training data is this pair of genes, an image of this pair of genes, it will try to predict the exact same pair of genes out the other end. Now on its own, that does not sound like a very useful thing to do. However, what makes them useful is that in the middle there is this embedding layer which is a very low dimensionality. And as such, the data or the information is forced through this um, small layer and then the decoder must recreate the, the image from those, that small, small embedding. So, for example, if you had a code size of 10, so if the embedding layer had only 10 different numbers, then, and the decoder was actually able to recreate the training images to any sort of reasonable level of accuracy, there must be a huge amount of information stored in those 10 images. And once you have this encoding, you can then use this for any standard classification, regression, machine learning task in general. There's something else I was supposed to say here. Oh yeah, so the consequences of this are, as a result of it being much smaller than the original input data and having much less noise, it then requires a lot less data and a lot less computational power in order to train the network. So that was the basic plain vanilla version of an autoencoder. What are some different flavors of it? Well, one of the most simplest is the denoising autoencoder. Denoising autoencoder is essentially the exact same as a plain vanilla autoencoder, except the input image has random noise added to it, whereas the output remains clean. Therefore, the, the network is trained to predict the clean image from the one with noise added to it. So not only does this re result in a more robust encoding, it also has some direct practical uses. The most obvious being denoising images. So if you have some process that gets in noisy images sometimes or all the time, you can use some formulation like this to help denoise them and then send them on to whatever else you want to do with them. Similarly, you can use it to denoise non-image data, such as um, the attributes of an item of clothing. Now, one of the biggest problems with these autoencoders is that their embeddings end up occupying quite narrow pockets in the latent space. And one of the most powerful uses of autoencoders is generating new data that was previously unseen, that's completely outside the training data. So in this example here, if you wanted to figure out, I wonder what half of this t-shirt and half of this shirt look like, if you submitted this through, if you got, say, the halfway point in their vectors and then put it through the decoder, it would output just pure noise. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even look like an item of clothing because it's, it's never seen something from this space or it really doesn't understand what something from that space looks like. So. A few other use cases of something like this might be to see what half rock, half classical music sounded like if you had encoded a load of different uh, songs. Um, or you can even use some vector arithmetic tick to kind of figure out what specific features look like. So it could be like what's a pair of glasses and you can add that to human faces if you had human faces here. Or from our example we could have, I wonder what either of these look like with a pocket or with or without buttons. 
Now, in order to train one of these variables, sorry, this leads us on to the concept of a variational autoencoder. So, in a variational autoencoder, what happens is instead of mapping or instead of encoding onto a single deterministic vector, your enco your the encoder instead maps onto a vector of a Gaussian distribution. So, instead of having one single vector, you now have two. One is, represents the mean of your distribution, and the other one represents the standard deviation. And then, in order to go from there, you would, instead of feeding through these um, deterministic numbers, you then sample from the distribution and go through the decoder from there. So in training this, if you input a full image, you run it through your decoder, it will predict the mu vector, standard deviation vector, and then you will sample from those and feed through the decoder as before. Now this, on its own, doesn't actually solve the problem at all. To do that, we must introduce some form of regularization into the process. So this is the loss function for, for the variational autoencoder. The term on the left is the reconstruction error, as before. It doesn't necessarily need to be MSE. I just left it there for simplicity. And the term on the right is the kullback liebler divergence, or whoever that's actually pronounced. And what, what that measures is essentially the distance between two distributions. And in this case, we measure the distance between our predicted distribution and the standard normal distribution. Thus, by minimizing this, we try to minimize both the reconstruction error and our predicted distribution's distance from the standard normal. Now, the beta term is a tuning parameter that controls the trade-off between reconstruction accuracy and generative ability. So if you look at on the left, this would be what happens if you trained using only reconstruction loss, so if beta was zero. You again have the same problem earlier where you have these pockets of space where the decoder has no idea what this means or how to interpret it. On the flip side, if you trained using only KL divergence, um, that means the network is only incentivized to try have your predicted distribution or every predicted distribution as standard normal. It doesn't care about reconstruction accuracy, so you end up with this mess. So the, the key is finding that sweet spot in the trade-off between, say, reconstructive accuracy and generative ability of your decoder later on. Now, how do we generate these new samples that we actually spoke of? I mentioned them earlier. From here, it's actually really simple vector arithmetic in the latent space. So I mentioned earlier you can figure out what half rock, half classical music sounds like. Well, if you had either a rock, one single rock song, or kind of their average mean vector of all rock music you input, and classical music, you can just get the halfway point between their two vectors, and then feed that through to decoder, and that will output whatever half rock and half classical music sounds like, or that album, as I put it. Bonus points if you know what that album is. Um, another thing we can do is we can generate specific attributes. So to, if we wanted to figure out what the glasses vector is, so if we wanted to add glasses to a human face, what you need is one image with glasses, of the human face, one image without glasses. You encode both of those, and then the difference between their encoded vectors will be glasses. So that difference will be essentially a glasses vector, and then you can use that glasses vector to add to add on to any other face, if you want to see what that face looks like with glasses. Or similarly, we at Outfitter, we could figure out what the pocket vector looks like, and we can add pockets to things to see what those would look like. Now, unfortunately, Outfitter doesn't pay me just to play with these cool algorithms all day. I actually have to provide some benefit to the business from time to time. So how do, what, how do we use these autoencoders to solve actual problems at Outfittery? Well, the, the lowest hanging fruit for this research stream was to try predict missing attributes. So we have lots of items of clothing in stock. We have lots of attributes for them, and some are missing. Now, this is actually a bigger problem for us than you might think. So not only does it adversely affect the performance of any models the data science team builds or uh, even just basic analysis. It also, it also has problems for the stylus because they use these attributes in searching. So it leads them to spending more time searching for whatever specific item they're looking for. But it also leads, to, or used to lead to, weird biases in stock usage. Because if, say, this shirt is missing, um, is missing the color, 
when someone's looking for a blue shirt, they'll never end up finding this shirt, and then it'll, thus it'll be used a lot less than it otherwise would be. Now, previously we had tried to predict the missing attributes using just the other attributes. So in this case, you'd have, you know, you have the category, you have the material, various other things. You you try to predict the missing ones, the so color in this case from those ones, but we had very little success with that. So in this case, we tried a few different formulations using the image. So the first we tried was the standard neural convolutional neural network. We fed through the full image, we trained it, we tuned it for every separate attribute, except this resulted in pretty poor performance, mainly due to lack of data. So the second thing we tried was, inevitably, we tried um, fitting an autoencoder to all the data first and encoding it, and then using these encodings uh, to predict any missing attribute. And we had much more success with this one. Um, and like in theory, you would expect that using a full image and a much more complex convolutional neural network would actually produce better results. It can capture more of the weird intricacies between it. So this is actually a really good example of autoencoders enabling you to do a lot more with less data. But we didn't stop at that. The final formulation we tried was we used these, these autoencoded vectors, and we also used the other attributes as well, one hot encoded, and then we just used that as a big predictor vector. And this ended up giving us the best performance. This is the best of all three for every single attribute. We had to train a separate model for each attribute. And now that's what we have in production. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, once you have these encodings, you can do some really cool things with some basic uh, vector arithmetic. One, one such thing is to get the cosine similarity between them. So you can see how similar two embeddings are. As such, we built our item similarity service, where any user within Outfittery can input the two unique IDs of any, any items we have or have had in stock, and we can return their similarity. Like a practical use case of this has been when stylists are pack, packing outfits and the exact item they want is out of stock, we can recommend replacement items. That means they don't have to go and kind of restart a whole new outfit because they're missing whatever piece of it. So now, back onto the primary problem we were trying to use these to solve. How can we use these to generate recommendations for our customers? So one thing you could try to do is look at customers' kept history and use the similarity service and try to recommend to them similar items. But is that what people really want from Outfittery? I feel if you've kept a one blue t-shirt, you don't want to be con consistently sent more and more blue t-shirts. Um, you want to wear something different every day. So while, so while people generally like to wear something different every day, they generally do keep to some sort of same style, whatever style might mean. And luckily for us, our entire order history is a set of professionally styled outfits. So we have lots of different pairs of items that we know have a good style fit together. And from there was born our wardrobe completer. So essentially what we do is we, can quant we built a model that can quantify the style fit of any two items of clothing, similar to the similarity service. And then we can use this to predict recommendations for customers based on our current stock and their kept item history, or the style fit with their kept item history. So before I finish, um, I guess what, what really has me kind of most excited about these autoencoders or kind of using them for you know, figuring out little bits like the glasses vector, the pocket vector, is that for me, it's very much kind of look, it's a, it's a complete different paradigm shift in the nature of the way we kind of do artificial intelligence. Previously, it was very much just l let them learn how to copy us, but now I feel, I feel we're starting to extract some sort of information from them. We got, we figured out what glasses were. We can figure out what a pocket is. Except at the moment, I feel we're kind of like these guys in Zoolander, where we know there's a lot of information in the computer, in these algorithms. We're just really struggling to figure out how to get it out thus far. Like I know, like you can imagine, say, if you had any artificial neural network trained to predict what's a cat and what's a dog, um, it's learned a lot about what cats and dogs are, or kind of at least images of them, or like the ratio of their faces. I don't know what they learn. But we really have no way to extract that information out. And I bet you if we could, we could learn something as humans about cats or dogs. 
Now, I'm not sure that knowing more about cats and dogs is necessarily hugely relevant for humanity or brings us that much benefit, but it doesn't require too many examples to think about ways that this could be really useful. So if you had some sort of model that can predict GDP really well using, I don't know, whatever, you might have a load of transaction data from the economy. If you could extract the information from that, you could actually learn a lot about what drives GDP and then use that for guiding government policy in the future. Or from our case at Ifittery, I think it'd be wonderful if instead of kind of just providing useful recommendations to the stylist, I would love to be able to teach the stylist something about style. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, and I hope you're all... Um, thanks, John. Really interesting. Um, we're going to do a, a short Q&A. So yeah. perhaps time for maybe three or four questions. So i uh, open it up to the floor if you have any questions. Gentlemen here. So there is no correct answer to that question. It very much depends on your exact use case. And even our different use cases actually use different dimensions. It wasn't like one standard vector of size 10 or whatever can capture everything there is about clothing. Um, sometimes you might, for whatever use case you have, you might want maybe 100. You could even go down to one if you want. Um, so it's kind of just that trade-off between, I guess, yeah, the simplicity of it and kind of capturing as much information. But obviously, the higher the dimensionality, the better reconstructive accuracy you get. So it really, it's kind of like most things here. It's a case of trial and error and figuring out what dimensionality works best for you um, for whatever use case you have. Like... So like what, what was our final dimensionality? Um, I'm probably not allowed to tell you something that specific about it. <laughs> I will tell you that they varied though. So like it, we, it wasn't like for each of the three use cases, we did have a different one, but I won't tell you what it is. Oh, um, yeah, you've got to specify human model. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, we, we are, all our stock pictures are taken with, um, yeah, actually, no, sorry, there is, yeah, other way around. It's, it's, it's headless, though, so there's very little of a human in our stock pictures, but, hmm? Yep. But the... So it, at the moment, we only train them using ours. But yeah, you could use them finding any kind of open source fashion data. The thing is, like, ours will only ever be used with our own images, our current use cases anyway, are only with our own images. So, and they're all kind of in that standard, we have a very standard way of photographing them all. So yeah, it, it kind of just works best if we use just our own images. But yeah, theoretically, you can go to Google Images and you know web scrape the entire t-shirt search and shirt and then feed them in. And yeah, you would be able to capture you know, much more information from there. But for the time being, we've only used our own images. Uh, we have more images, but we're only using one at the moment. We're only, because essentially it varies. We have between one and nine pictures of each item taken from different angles. Whereas the first one is always the standard, like as you kind of saw in those ones. So at the moment we're only training using one, but yeah, you can input obviously any number of images. Yeah, so for the encoding part, we actually did use, um, I won't tell you which one, but a pre-trained network. And then, yeah, and then kind of put our own training training samples through as well. But yeah, like for the encoding part, you can use those pre-trained networks perfectly. And that's a great way to kind of get started with just a little, even less data. Time for one more question. Oh, sorry, 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 you get first. So we, you can not ex implicitly tell us by returning the items, but we, 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 don't, um, we do have some sort of feedback, um, but it's quite crude at the moment. But 
like essentially the feedback we get is like we send out boxes of closed customers and we get you know more than half return generally. So that is the kind of feedback and in terms of I like this or I don't like this. Um, I, gu I guess I guess it depends whether you're talking about like actual company plans or plans that I want implemented. Um, but yeah, like I, I think the same way. I like I'm constantly trying to push for you know non-data sciencey projects just to capture more and more customer information. Um, yeah, fashion Tinder has been one that I've been trying to trying to push forever. Um, but at the mo at the moment, our kind of feedback at, or for all these networks are kind of trained just on kept or not kept is kind of the the bulk of the feedback. But yeah, I want, I want to start getting loads more stuff like that. You can upload pictures, but very few people have done it, and we don't actually use them in any sort of, we definitely don't have enough of them to, to be able to generalize any sort of model to the uploaded pictures, because those are. So Facebook have maybe Facebook data structure, you know, the picture there, the style and stuff? You sound like me. <laughs> this, is, this is every meeting, I'm just like, can we just get more stuff about the customers? We kind of just know like, you know, basic demographics and, and um, a few kept history, but um, no, like I, I definitely, we, we don't do that, any of that at the moment, but I definitely want to, and I have, like they can only get better with stuff like that in them. Okay, so um, if, feel free for any other questions, uh, grab one at the end of the presentations. Um, so we're on to uh, chat two four, so Sebastian, uh, first, uh, are you personally to speak on? Okay, cool. I think we have two, we have one microphone, and another one here. Can you hear me on the screen? Stream? I don't know where to put this. <laughs> Try view. All right. Okay. Hi and welcome to our humble office. My name is Sebastian. This is Mike. We are here at Scout Twenty. Oh, the light. We are at Scout Twenty Four. We are working as data scientists. Well, I'm the team lead for the data science team at Scout, and Mike is my senior data scientist with me. Um, louder, all right, okay. That's usually not a problem that I have. Usually I'm talking too loud. So. <laughs> all right, um, yes, first of all, I would like to um, give you a short um, introduction to our company and what we are currently dealing with. You probably know Immobilien Scout and or Auto Scout, which are two household brand names. So we cover the real estate and the uh, mobile market. Um, with uh, we are basically marketplaces for those. We have created a new dedicated unit for uh, adjacent business services, which we call consumer services, where we do like um, ads and um, and things like that, where we earn uh, monetize. Um, on other channels just than the um, specific listings for cars or real estates. We are currently present in five um, core geographies across Europe and we have a reach of roughly 80 million households and yeah, more than three million active listings distributed over both um, cars and real estates. So we have a lot of lots of data to deal with all on our websites and um, we actually get lots of customer or user interaction and feedback, implicit feedback mostly, but well, we also have some stuff to struggle with. A couple of years ago, we um, created a mobile first strategy and this is definitely not new. Everybody has done this. Everybody is in a mobile first train, so to speak. Um, but um, similar to that, we started this year out to actually turn our company into an AI ready company. We wanna be, well, basically we wanna spread the word of how awesome AI is and actually turn every Scouty into a believer, so to speak. And we want to make uh, these kind of discussions easier in the future with where we need more data. And um, we plan to be there three to five years where most of the um, stuff from the company is actually knowledgeable and basic about data science and machine learning and AI so that they know the value of the data and 
can come up with their own product ideas, that it's not just us. Yep, how are we organized as a data group? Basically, we have a data lake, which, uh, and we have a data catalog and a meta data store for that, where we draw all the data from. Most of that is in the cloud, so we work heavily with AWS. We have a specific data engineering team, which is basically responsible for that and maintaining these tools. And um, the lake itself, we have another team which is responsible to grant easy access to all, every colleague throughout the company, um, uh, which is the access services and solutions team. This includes um, the um, BI front end tools, for example, like MicroStrategy. We also have an analytics team with lots of analysts who are spread across all the business units uh, and some are um, central in the core team and they basically, um, well, analyze the data, surprise, and they um, get lots of insight from that and feed this insight, these insights back to the, um, to the business units and try to upskill them in an analytical sense so that they understand the value of the data itself and actually um, are able to do the analysis more and more themselves. The dream is to have some kind of self-service analytics there. Um, we are part of the data products team, I would say, which is basically us as data science team who is building and um, training models and actually um, trying to hand them over to the data product engineering team in order to, together with them, to bring them into production and build production-ready APIs in the end. I mean, we are similar to Kona at Outfittery. We are building end-to-end -end products and actually that have an impact and that are used. So we do applied machine learning. We do not really do research in a sense. So we use what is out there. We try to keep up to date with the latest trends and technologies by visiting conferences, summer schools and all that stuff and following the um, industry in order to take what is out there and um, come up with use cases and build products based on that. Um, well, the team that I'm leading is currently consisting of seven scientists, which is not really true. We are six, the seventh will start soon, and um, we are planning to grow it, especially in order to kind of convert the whole company, which is more than 1,200 people, in order to become AI believers, of course. And uh, we work um, across two locations, Munich and Berlin. We also have a delivery center in Barcelona, but actually um, that's more for the product engineering teams and the builders themselves, not just for us. We do not really have any stakes there. Well, we have some stakeholders sitting there, but we don't really engage there ourselves. Um, the data product engineering team is cross-located as well, and um, it's rather small, as you can see, so it's not fully established yet, but we aim to establish it uh, shortly as well and grow it into a, to a sufficient size so that we can actually deliver and scale there. And um, this talk, Mike will now take over and we'll talk about um, our two price estimation models and the learnings that we've done there. Um, about cars and how it actually helped us with the real estate model. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, as Sebastian said, um, I will talk, I will tell you about the journey we did with the car and uh, real estate prediction at Scout. Uh, the price uh, prediction at Scout is one of our most important topics for the data science team. And I will show you the initial approach of the car price estimation. So the objective was, okay, uh, the objective for the data science team was for Auto to develop a car price prediction. And yeah, there were two teams, the data science team and the data engineering team. Both of them uh, didn't work very closely together, so there was no feedback loop and so the data science team started to develop um, yeah, some models in R. It, was, it were some random forest models and yeah, they didn't think about the productionizing of the models at first. And so they developed, um, they took the data from the last two years and then um, created models for all the countries where are uh, available and for all the make models combinations, they are available on our platform. They created a, model, a, full, a full model and a light model. 
light model means with only a few parameters, we can already uh, estimate the price. And the full model means, okay, with all the data we have, uh, try to predict the price exactly as we can. Um, so then it came to production and the uh, data engineering team took over and then they realized, okay, R code is not the best you can do in production. So the production was running on Java and Scala and then they used H2O to translate the uh, R code into Java classes and that took quite a long time and the uh, yeah, training, up the training cycle and putting the trained model into the production um, took uh, quite a long time and it was uh, quite hard to maintain all the model and it was error prone and all the stuff you can think of. Also the ramp up time uh, when a server was crashed uh, was more than uh, one hour so auto scaling uh, was not available, it was not possible and yeah then we uh, yeah here's one example so we took the data from the database trained the R model and then we had a random forest model here's this uh, example for the Volkswagen Wolf as a tree and then the data engineering team took over and uh, brought it to production. The next iteration was which is currently in the rollout phase is already user facing in some quantities but not in all um, we learned something that, uh, okay, let's bring the data engineering team and the data science team much closer together to uh, decrease the feedback loop and um, yeah, try to use production ready systems. So uh, we replaced uh, R by Python and also on the, on the prediction side for the productionizing, we used Python instead of R, uh, uh, instead of Java. Uh, we placed we replaced again um, uh, as well the the uh, random forest model by a light GML model, so and we could uh, decrease the complexity of the models dramatically. You saw that we had before more than uh, ten thousand models, and we could decrease the complexity to one model. So we have only one model for all the countries, for the light and full model, and uh, for all the make model combinations. Uh, what we also did is optimize the light GBM model with Treelight. I will say some words about Treelight in a few seconds. And uh, in addition to that, we could uh, decrease the prediction time in order of magnitude to 0 0.2 uh, milliseconds and also could uh, decrease the memory consumption dramatically from one more than one gigabyte uh, to uh, below two megabytes. That was uh, with that we could um, yeah implement auto scaling. We dockerize everything. We put everything into the cloud. Uh, everything is running currently in a ACS cluster at AWS. And yeah, for us as a data science team, we have much more maintenance effort. Uh, we have shorter training cycles. The model is more stable, and it's much more cost efficient. Also. One important thing, uh, the accuracy uh, was also increased by up to 76% per model, make model combination. Uh, here an overview of how Treelight works. So basically you have your tree ensembles like XGBoost, LightGBM, Scikit-Learn or some other custom models and Treelight compiles it uh, to one C file and this one C file is only necessary for the productionizing system to make very fast predictions. And you can even uh, tune the prediction time uh, if you want, and it's really amazing tool. Um, the real estate valuation at Imo Scout, um, it was almost the same setup, but the um, real estate valuation is much older. It was already developed in 2010. There was an engineering team there was a data science team, the data science team developed in R, the engineering team in Java, and yeah, with almost the same issues. So how to bring R code into production? And uh, in this approach, we used uh, Orchid database as an interface for the, for, the, uh, for the engineering team. So we um, trained a linear regression model in R, or well several, regression models in R and um, 
wrote all the coefficients from the li linear regression into an Oracle database in-house and the engineering team uh, read all the data from the Oracle database and used it in production. Um, the model is based on a linear regression and, and a nearest neighbor search and it's almost the same since 2010 but uh, we have a lot of issues with the old running system. So the algorithm is based on a, on a geo hierarchy uh, at first. So we have countries, federal state in Germany, cities, districts, and even lower, uh, smaller parts in Germany. And that are coefficients in our regression model. But the areas are changing over time. So there are some merges and the, the, the shape is divided and everything like this. So and for all this area, we have a lot of problems. Also, um, in 2010, Scout was not in the cloud, and all the stuff we did was in-house. So we had an in-house computing center, and some parts of the algorithm is still running on in-house systems. So we moved some of the parts uh, into the cloud, but yeah, it's divided in-house and uh, cloud computing, so it's a hard mix. So for this model, uh, for this approach, we had at the end uh, 1,700 models, and there are even more because uh, there were a lot of adoptions for special purposes over the time for special customers for special needs of some uh, departments as well. Um, so because we had the issues with the geo hierarchy, the, the legacy systems, and all the stuff, um, we de developed a prototype in 2014 and replaced also R with Python, and tools for, par for parallelization, we used uh, PySpark, but uh, the, the approach we choose was okay. Instead of the using the geo hierarchy, uh, we used uh, Kriging and uh, used for the Kriging part R. So we there was again uh, some complexity here. But yeah, most of you know will know it, um, that um, Kriging, is very time consuming to train. So we had, we divided the country into different cells and at the end we had more than 100,000 models. Um, again, the complexity was quite high, but, uh, but the accuracy was much better than the old legacy system and we had uh, less issues. And, but then there was a big change in the company, the owner changed and then the priorities uh, changed as well. And, we stopped with the project and continued at uh, last year and quarter four. In quarter four. Um, here, okay, we didn't look at other approaches because we invested a lot of time in 2014 and thought, okay, let's continue and bring the system live as soon as possible. So the only thing we did was uh, replacing the R part and the Krieging uh, with, um, Gaussian processes in Python, scikit-learn, and brought everything into the AWS cloud. But we had new issues. So, okay, we had more than 100,000 models. Uh, the com the it was again very uh, hard to train even the cloud. And in some areas we saw some really bad instabilities and low performances, even in key regions like Berlin, some parts of Berlin. And then we brainstormed again and again in the team and added more and more complexity to the model because we read a lot of papers and then, yeah, all tried everything we read, but at the end it didn't work uh, as we wanted. So then we brainstormed again and with our colleagues from, from Unique, uh, which were in charge for the Autoscout uh, algorithm. And then they said, okay, let's try the Autoscout approach for the Scout. And yeah, luckily it worked. So. <laughs> Short story. <laughs> uh, so at the end, we use the same model, the light GBM model with, with the tree light optimization. Um, for all the real estate types we have on our platform, house by apartment by house rent and apartment rent in one model. Um, we could even uh, use reuse the same stacks like uh, the API infrastructure and everything like this. And 
yeah, at the end, we could decrease the um, complexity again dramatically, uh, could rec uh, reduce the training cost, uh, the maintenance effort, and again, the, the uh, accuracy was much better than before. Yeah, that's all. That's it? Uh, I don't need that one. Thanks. Uh. All right, now to some learnings, if they were not already obvious. Um, first of all, one obvious mistake we made was, well, we stick to what worked in the past for far too long. Actually, we were not really able to convince our stakeholders and the people in charge that take, took the decisions that we needed to invest into the real estate valuation, for example, in order to actually keep it up to date and prove it. Everybody was known, uh, knowing, okay, our customers were not really happy with it, but somehow it still works, it's still sold, and we get revenue, so we have other more important issues to work on. Um, another mistake we made was that we didn't care for the um, model deployment ourselves. And I think, I honestly, I truly believe that this is one of the worst things that you could do. Hand over your model to someone else to bring it to production. As soon as you start with that, you actually, you automatically include interface breaks. Like the so obvious things, so stupid things, now with hindsight actually, well, why do you uh, pr predict in production in a totally different language than in the language that you actually train in? And things like that. It sounds so silly and it's even kind of embarrassing to talk about that right now, but actually we were so stupid. And I'm pretty sure that not all of you were doing or are doing differently. Um, so I think that's um, something that you should really get rid of in case you're doing it or see someone else doing it. Um, strictly follow the approaches from research, well, we usually don't do that so strictly, but in that specific sense we did, and well, it hurt us quite a bit. Uh, there was actually no research to be found on how we solved it in the end with um, boost trees with, for the real estate valuation, for instance. Um, instead, the research showed that, well, other companies out there and other uh, countries, they made it work. It worked with the Gaussian processing, with the Kriging, so there got to be a way. And we, in the hindsight, we invested too much time in actually trying to fit this into our um, world as well. Another important thing is that never believe that a single scientist can know it all. There are probably only a very few um, well-known, popular rock stars, golden unicorns out there who probably do know all or most of it, um, but most likely not we or our colleagues. So we definitely need to be open and the scientist per se is very introvert and trying to focus on his uh, project himself, themselves, singular they of course. And um, instead, well, I think that we can learn a lot from agile cooperation here uh, as a science group in order to benefit from each other and um, actually, yeah, let others help us and find shortcuts. There are lots of shortcuts out there. And another very important thing is we'll never be hesitant to bin several months of work. We actually did it and we're still standing here. We haven't been fired yet. <laughs> That's definitely a lesson to take away, all right? Um, instead, first of all, always challenge yourself and the approach you're taking. Um, I must say this is only partially true, I would say, uh, because you only you, know, you have to challenge it in the right way you work. I mean, it's not about, well, I can increase the accuracy. That's something that all of you can, I'm pretty sure. And you will always think of ways how to improve the accuracy or reduce the loss or whatever. But that's not the ultimate goal, at least for applied machine learning. The ultimate goal is to generate business value. So there will be some KPIs and your stakeholders, the product people, the decision makers are not really the ones who care about loss or accuracy. They're more the ones who care about revenue, sessions, leads, things like that. And this is something you need to translate how your model actually impacts those KPIs and when is it enough. And that's it. And, uh, and But challenging the approach you took and whether or not it is better to actually work on on a different approach uh, because it just doesn't work. It doesn't get good enough, fast enough. That's more important there. That's the that's message. Then brainstorm with your peers, of course. Well, we did this. 
luckily, but in hindsight, well, probably, no, definitely too late. And most of all, care about the production deployment yourself. That's really important there too, um, well, for obvious reasons, of course. And we um, learned that we better try out things that work now, even if there is no research about them, and that we can copy from other fields. I mean, it's actually a very good success story that the um, car estimation model, which is already working in production, is helping us on the real estate side so tremendously as well. This, this shift saved the project and probably saved our asses too. And then test things out in production as early as possible, another very important step. Um, well, here at SCART, we try to be very agile, very MVP-oriented. We try to do A-B testing in production as soon as possible. Yes, there's always room for improvement in terms of getting a feedback cycle impl uh, implemented and uh, using this feedback. True, we are not good at it either. And that's the dream for us too. But still trying to find out whether or not the model works, if it's viable to continue, or if it's even viable to stop already because it's good enough and think more about polishing the product rather than tuning the model itself is very important there as well. So it keeps you on the right track. It keeps, it, it, it guarantees that you invest into the right things. And this way it's easier for you to actually make an impact with your stakeholders and actually probably get some or one or the other listen to you when you say I need more customer feedback. All right? That's it. Thank you, Sebastian and Mike. Um, we have uh, some time for maybe four questions for Q&A. So, Tobias. Can you go to the architecture slide? That was really interesting. Just to Last API. So it means that you could deploy your model without deploying the other APIs and the APIs will be consistent. Yeah. Yes. So you can just update the file. Yeah, basically so our, file. our team provides a backend API for the front end facing team actually to communicate with and to, uh, well, they are just our clients, and internal clients, so we have less <laughs> restrictions on authentication, of course. Uh, network guys take that over. And, um, Yes, exactly. And we have, um, they are our clients. We just serve the, pred um, the, the, the predictions out there and they have the integration with the front end itself, yeah. And we, we train the model in a data pipeline um, regularly. This one, I think, is trained weekly or monthly, probably, but it could be trained daily. And it's just uploading the weights to S3. The API is regularly loading them from S3 or some, in some other scenario, we have it where we just re- Redeploy um, S3 and uh, redeploy ECS containers at night and have an overlapping window where we just up, um, draw the latest or download the latest weights from the from from S3. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. You need to be careful not to give away too many company secrets, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. If you're as a real estate agent, the most important thing is location, location, and again, location. Yes. <laughs> and all the stuff uh, like condition and uh, interior quality and all the stuff um, afterwards. 
and we tried some approaches where we use some de demographical data and all this other stuff, uh, but it didn't really increase the performance of the model. Which of the models? The error? Yeah. Um, interesting. You're more interested in real estate. <laughs> okay. Um, I think so. Yeah, we can. <laughs> now it's now it's my butt on the line, all right? <laughs> and I'm a racket. The median error is twelve percent. Um, and if you ask. Um, Real estate expert, twenty percent difference, uh, even for some. Is this good uh, well, I f liable in court. So mm -hmm. you are liable in court for um, as soon as your prediction exceeds twenty percent. Yeah. Uh, the the error exceeds twenty percent. So with twelve percent, in a specific scenario for a specific real estate type, uh, we are quite safe there. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Yeah, me median ape. Yeah, that's pretty much the same. Final question. And the prediction of interest. We haven't implemented that yet. We'd, we would train a separate model for that, but there's no business case or use case out there yet. Well, the, the countries are more relevant for the car prediction because uh, the auto scout site is operating in the other countries. Emo scout is just operating in Germany and Austria so far. Um, basically, the, the country itself is a feature. So um, that way we, we kind of worked around that thing. In the end, we, we just... We, 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 when while we gave the, the ah too far, the better maps for instance um, are just for two countries. I mean um, Belgium and 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 France for instance, uh, Belgium, and France, and they are even include the um, the difference between light and full model. As we said, we have one model for all countries plus all make models plus light and full version. So we basically got rid of the light model. So as soon as you have five parameters instead of four, you can use a, get a more accurate prediction. Although the current implementation just, or the old legacy implementation just allowed you to use either four or nine features. And um, in order to make those new model, this new model comparable to the old ones in order to convince stakeholders to invest into rolling out the new ones, um, we artificially um, um, t checked and tested the light model and the full model. And well, yes, in terms of light and full and in terms of um, countries, we have different accuracies there, but we already grasped that we captured that with the um, country itself, the region as a feature itself. Grab, uh, yeah, we will be standing out there, of course, so you can. Yeah. Looking forward. Thanks. Thanks. Is enough? Is this enough? Can you hear me? Is this enough there? Cool. Did I break anything again? Um, sorry. Great start. Um, hello. <laughs> 
Um, I, yeah, so I don't have so many slides. Um, I want, and it's the end, so I want to make this a little bit more, more interactive, so I want to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, who actually practices machine learning here? It's quite, quite a lot of people. So who's a machine learning engineer? Right, data scientist, software engineer. What's the difference? You decide, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've mostly worked in startups where you have to make up your own job title. Okay. <laughs> who wants to work in machine learning? Okay. Who doesn't, who, who chose the wrong room? <laughs> the rest, I guess. Okay. Uh, cool. So, yeah, I, I saw, um, or maybe it's good to, pre like, to introduce myself uh, very quickly. So, my name is Tobias. Uh, my background is in theoretical physics. So I was uh, developing um, quantum computing algorithms, uh, specifically error correction, quantum error correction, uh, in research in uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and California before moving to machine learning. And for the past years, I've been working as, I could say, machine learning consultant. And for the most recent time, we've, I've been part of a, kind of like a stealth network of uh, machine learning practitioners, and we consult usually corporations uh, on how to build end-to-end -end machine learning systems and then also build them. Um, so this was, for example, across industries, this was FMCG, so fast-moving consumer goods. Uh, we worked in industry, chemical manufacturing, um, where we um, applied the, the DeepMind paper where they, where they optimized um, energy consumption in a data center for chemical, chemical processes. Uh, and most recently, we, uh, we worked on a fintech project in, um, for, European, for European financial institution uh, that was uh, under more heavy regulation, especially GDPR, um, as, as of this year. And um, yeah, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about what we did there. Unfortunately, the details are under <laughs> very heavy NDA, so it's more of an architectural overview. Um, of the challenges that we faced, and most importantly, I would really like to hear from you guys uh, if you had experience with GDPR, how it impacted your, your machine learning practice, and what you learned from it. This is cool. So make GDPR sexy again, maybe that was a lie. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Also, uh, I do machine learning, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm also not an encryption specialist. So take all of this with a grain of salt. Basically, we were thrown into a project um, where we, oh, where it was a, where was a major um, European financial corporation, um, and they have lots of client data. In uh, the original databases, they use IBM and Oracle, and uh, we were tasked to build um, an end-to-end -end machine learning solution for them. And they were like, oh, also, by the way, can you make it GDPR compliant? We were like, well, what, is, what does GDPR compliant mean? They were like, well, we hope you guys know. <laughs> and, and so we kind of had to, had to figure things out on the way. So maybe what is interesting, this is basically every, like all that we build in, in, in any project. There's some sort of original data. In this case, um, the databases were used as archives over the last 20 years or so, so these databases were really, really slow. So you couldn't, couldn't even do a count on a single table just because it took so long and they were distributed. Um, so we were tasked to move data into a high performance cluster. Um, we, in this case, we used Hadoop on, on Azure. Um, then you have to do the machine learning part, you know, join all the tables, build features on top of it, um, design, uh, choose a model, train a model and then also move this model to, to an API as a microservice, uh, as uh, the, the guys before did, to, to serve predictions. So where is GDPR critical? First, um, of course, there's personal data that is moving into a cloud, or, well, it's not supposed to move into a cloud. And then it also affects the machine learning part. Why is that so? There's three basic pillars of GDPR and uh, then the data processing across of it. So the first is the right for non-discrimination. This includes that um, for specific use cases, um, data that includes um, gender, race, sexual orientation, or political views 
are not supposed to be used unless a person um, agrees that this data is being used for this particular use case. The second one is the right to explanation. So if a decision is made about you with, a, with an algorithm, you have the right to, a requ to, to request an explanation why, why this happened. And uh, as you might know, with neural networks, this can be quite tricky. So um, this is also important for the practice. And then there's the right to be forgotten. So you as a consumer have the right to ask a company that owns your data to, to delete it. A lot of companies, especially corporations, are not even unable to find all your data so, uh, that they have. And this is very boring. <laughs> Um, but it also poses interesting questions. So if I send Outfittery a request that I want to be forgotten, do they have to retrain the model that included my data? It's not so clear, actually. Um, and on top of that is data. Oh, I'm doing some laser. Oh, it's okay. And then uh, on top of that, or below in that case, there's also data processing. So we, as a, as a company that comes in and builds solutions, becomes a data processor as defined by GDPR, and uh, this is under certain regulations, especially when it comes to private data. So um, this part, so this, this is really important for, uh, with regards to the data processing, because what they did originally, so if you move data to a cloud, this is, this is FinTech. If you move in Outfittery, for example, it's, it's not under so heavy government regulations. In, in, in the fintech and banking sector, there's more heavy regulations. So what they did was they wanted to use, they didn't want to use their own servers, or they didn't have their own servers, to, so they moved to the cloud. Um, but they, the government forbid them to have shared CPUs. So if you're on AWS or Azure, then you share CPUs. And there was a hack this year, actually. It wasn't this year where you could access RAM of other processes on the same CPU. So if, if someone figures out a way to do that, that's not good. So they had to have their own dedicated cloud serv service. But they were old. So we had to move to, to, to another architecture, which is, in this case, was Hadoop on Azure. And uh, there we shared CPUs and also physically not separated not separated hard drives. So that means under GDPR that all personal identifiable information has to be encrypted somehow. This is all sorts of information that can be retraced to find you as a person. This can be your name, your birthday, your address. So this is this is step one. It was important. Uh, we were like, all right, I guess we're gonna have to figure out a way to do that. And then uh, the other two parts. So the first the first pillar was not so important because people who wanted to get um, who, 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 whose data we have, they wanted us to use it. Um, but the right to explanation really uh, limited the choice of models. Uh, so tree models are really good for explanation, of course, because you can literally walk down the tree and tell, tell a person why a decision was made. Neural networks are not so great for this. Um, and then the right to be forgotten, as I said, in theory, it seems like you have to retrain a model without that data. But in practice, it doesn't really matter. And it's not really clear what exactly the right to be forgotten means in the machine learning sense. So this is how we started. And we're like, OK, we need to first move everything into like an encrypted sort of system. So we, our process was to identify all PAIs across, uh, I think we had about 50 tables with 3,000 columns or so, uh, where we manually had to go through them um, because they hadn't done that before and talk to the data protection officer of this particular firm that uh, happened to be a lawyer and um, without access to the database. Um, so if you, if you ever assign a data protection officer, I would recommend that this person has access to the database. <laughs> Little take home message. <laughs> so um, basically this person then told us, right, this is a PAI, this is not a PAI, this is what we need to get sued for, this is what we not get sued for. So we had a, <laughs> we had a master file of, 
of PII columns, personal identifiable information, and uh, we created an encrypted mapping file. So for each column that appeared in any of the tables, we created, we created a single key, a random key for each column that we then, uh, that we then encrypted first with, with, AW, uh, with, <laughs> with AES. So we had RUM ciphers to uh, DN encrypt data. But if you do this right, um, then you're unable to join tables. Um, this, yeah, I told you I'm not an expert in encryption. We found out the hard way. Um, so we had to use a second line of encryption where we uh, just hashed the values. Uh, where we used the same salt for each column. And so we had each PII column as a hashed field and as, a, as an encrypted field and build a, build a token server that uh, would authentic, uh, authenticate um, a machine learning engineer with a request so that you can on the fly in RAM, RAM is relatively safe, so that you can um, use the original data in RAM to generate features. For example, in this case, we wanted to use the age of a, uh, of a user, but the field is encrypted, so we cannot use the actual age. But we can, we can decrypt it in RAM calculate the age in month, which is not a PII, and then use this as a feature in the algorithm. And that happened to work really well. Um, <laughs> this is from Fight Club, so happy you're here as well. Um, I'm wondering what experience you guys had with GDPR, if it affected you in any way uh, on your work, and if you had to solve it and how you solved it. Anyone, has anyone heard of GDPR before? <laughs> had anyone has had, had anyone had anyone to deal with this before? Yeah. Yes. So we had an issue with the human cases while training a network. Yeah. So we couldn't use our own images for that. So we basically got a, another data set from America for one thousand two hundred euros. So they were also like. Uh, so it was also too big for you guys to anonymize it yourself. Yeah. But you were, were you even allowed to look at them? We were, <laughs> but not the customers. Yeah. It's really, it's really tricky. Anything else? So in many cases, I think it just breaks the integrity of the data. Right? If someone saves the data about someone, then if some particular parts must be deleted from the request, then if the database was designed 10 years back, does not, does not assume such an action. Yeah. There's a question about sure. the way you anonymize the data. And if you actually look in the topic of like differential privacy, because I'm just wondering how you can give me any guarantees that your approach will actually anonymize the data. So I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an encryption specialist. I would never recommend anything to you to do. <laughs> Uh, I'm letting you know what we did. Um, <laughs> differ <laughs> so, the differential privacy is an issue, especially linkage attacks. Um, and if someone actually has access to the data, then I don't think it's guaranteed that this person cannot find a way to somehow trace it back. But obviously, this is like the very last layer of protection. So this is behind two, three firewalls and VPNs and auth authentication methods. Well, so. Yeah, you create it. You, create, you, need, you need to. Yeah, it's. You have a unique ID per per user. That's true, and so that that gives gives space for linkage attacks. But this is really just the last. So you shouldn't even get access to the data in the first place. Mm -hmm.
-hmm. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so in particular, the age was actually a really important feature. So, in, so our first approach was to just drop everything, <laughs> create a random key, uh, and then and then move it there. Uh, but they actually wanted to reuse this data for for um, for other external parties, and uh, so we had to had to use it. Uh, well, so this is a snapshot of the of the of the whole system that we use for training. So this is this is part of a data pipeline that we built. So we have to rerun the pipeline. The other way, the birthday, the birth, so this data contained the birthday, which we cannot use or ever kind of decrypt in, uh, on hard drive. So we load it into RAM, decrypt it, calculate the age in months, and then rewrite it as part of the machine learning pipeline. Everything, everything you do in so so this is um, memory is considered safe. So in the same mostly. Thing, so future example, you get a picture of someone, <laughs> you learn from it, and you throw it away. Is it GDPR compliant? Well, I'm not gonna be able to answer questions that are yes or no regarding GDPR. <laughs> um, so the the. the the encryption was done on on a dedicated server where no no one else had access to, so it wasn't a question. I think if you do it on AWS with PII data, that's a bad idea. With a shared CPU, so this wasn't not a, not a shared CPU anymore. Exactly. Yeah. That's so. That's what they that's what they did originally with these guys. So those are, those were dedicated instances. <laughs> and here we also had to spin up a single dedicated instance to do that. Um, slightly off, well, away from the presentation, but do you know if anyone's actually got caught or in trouble with GDPR yet? So if any company has got fined or is it I don't know. Uh, so what I was told, at least in uh, Germany, is that what happened, so GDPR originated, okay, it's data protection, but it originated because the um, the governmental department that takes care of this uh, doesn't have the time to actually go through all of that, to, to go to all companies. It's kind of like, like forbidding spam or getting, giving heavy fines on spam. It's just going to do something about the heavy spammers because you can find them. And it's the same with GDPR. It's to protect against big fish uh, fucking up with data. And so the reality of the situation is probably going to be that this department is going to send out questionnaires to companies to ask if they have data processing officers and rules, if they know what, and there's very basic things like, what do the, colors in your, the columns in your database mean? And a lot of companies cannot answer this question. <laughs> and um, corporations. And uh, they're going to send out questionnaires to ask about processes. And whenever someone cannot answer pro to, to this questionnaire, they're going to have to send in people. But they actually don't want to send in people because they don't have a lot of them. I've heard of a case in the Netherlands. Someone, a bank, so a client, asked what kind of data do you have to a bank. They did not take it seriously. So he's asked them again and again and again to go to the court and the bank got fined. Did he get 200,000 euros? From your intuition, uh, do you feel like less personal and fine data is being gathered? Do I what? Like, uh, is less personalized and private data is being gathered now after GDPR? Or lots of services, they updated their terms and their terms, and now on every website, you have this pop up saying, yes, no.
Well, some, some, it's a good question. I think some um, uh, newspapers, other newspapers, actually just talked about this before, just shut down their service in Europe, if you happen to like notice. You could check, if you go into Chicago Tribune, yeah. um, they'll just say we don't. Yeah, we're sorry, you're in Europe. I guess some. Um, I think what changed for sure is is this part. Uh, the sorry, the where is it? Is it the data processing, and the data rights, so that they have to tell you what exactly is going to happen with your data. Uh, in the in the in the financial sector that we work with recently, um, everyone who goes there and gives them the data, they actually give it so that are being used. So there, um, it wasn't really an issue. Um, so, I think it depends on the country, and there are some countries within Europe that are more open to allow different kinds of models. No. Well, I mean, the reality is there's a person from the government or group of the department that asks you to explain your model. And if you can explain it, then it's explainable. <laughs> and some, some countries are more understanding of that. Also, if you can show clear results that, that your model improves whatever you're scoring. But that doesn't come with the, when the user gives the rights. Exactly. Nationality, for example, yeah. Or whatever my uh, mm -hmm. belief or something like this. So, or, uh, for example, an age. So, mm -hmm. the date of birth, maybe I'm discriminated based on age, my credit score, basically, I'm discriminated against my age, for example. Uh, that means, so, the particular machine learning models are not allowed to use these features. Is there like a particular list? 
It's um, unfortunately not that easy. Uh, so there's some things that are just not allowed. Uh, and there's some things that you can consent to be used. And then there's some things where if you show that this actually is important to provide a certain accuracy, the regulator is going to allow. Uh, and then uh, there's some features that are very indirectly inferred from other features. And that's kind of a tricky business. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, so, uh, sorry, I think. Uh, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're also hiring. Uh, so if you're interested, if you're a machine learning engineer, data scientist, data engineer, software engineer, or you just want to hang out, <laughs> 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 say hi. Uh, should mean email. You'll find me online, I guess. Um, I guess there's beers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of food out there and drink. Uh, feel free to grab any one of us, uh, myself, Samuel, Rebecca, any one of the speakers afterwards as well.